good. Okay, it looks like I'm recording too. I can't help you with that, but here we go. Hey, Charlotte. Um, can you give me co-host so I can share? Um, I guess. Got it? No. Maybe I've got the wrong person. Sorry. That's all right. They call me Sally, by the way. Oh, sorry. I just see the yeah, name I on. <laughs> I know. I don't know if you talked. Did you talk to Nancy? About what? Do you know that she's sick as a dog? Yeah, she let me know, unfortunately. Okay. All right, so um, I know that there are folks that are coming. Okay. Our people are here, there, and everywhere. No problem. We can. I wait. didn't think I was going to be able to make the meeting because it's my husband's birthday, and we were supposed to go oh. out to dinner, and we got there, and the restaurant wasn't open. So, ah, my that's... desperate plea from Nancy, <laughs> I was able to, I was able to um, get home and get get it going. No problem. Go ahead. You can. I'm. I'm ready to start whenever. If you want to wait for a few minutes for people, I want. Let's That's... wait a few minutes. I. I know that there are a couple of my, uh, a couple of our club members that are. Um, we're planning to, be here. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people. A lot of sometimes it's discouraging to look at how many people there are here that are here. But I know a lot of people, um, look at these, at, at the recording later. So yeah, that's fine. Okay, I got one more. I'm going to run and grab my coffee. I'll be right back. Okay. You need to get one of those things that raises up the burner. Okay, I'm back.
Okay, Jenny, I don't know if you can hear me. I can. But if you can, um, let's get started and hopefully people will join in as they as they get free. Okay. Uh can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Okay, great. And welcome everybody <laughs> who's on and thank you for Jenny for for coming and doing our um our program. I uh, was fortunate enough to judge at SUNY uh, Cobleskill for two years with the Albany Obedience. And it's a really wonderful facility. And I really enjoyed being there and meeting the kids and, um, and learning about your program. It's really a great thing. Yeah, it's a cool place. I'm happy to be there. And thanks for inviting me to talk. So Nancy asked me to give a talk on some of the research I've done because um, we got to talking about what I've done. So most of what I'm talking about today, I actually did. Well, all of what I'm talking about today, I did at my last job. So I was at the Penn Vet Working Dog Center, um, but now I'm at SUNY Cobble Skill in the canine department. But I figured I'd give you a little bit of my background because my background isn't actually um, wholly in detection dogs. So I actually first started my work with animals working with non-human primates. So I did my undergrad at Georgia State, and then I did my master's degree at Bucknell University, working mostly with the monkeys on the left of your screen here, capuchin monkeys. Um, though I did a little bit of work with some macaques and squirrel monkeys and baboons when I was at Bucknell. Um, so most of my training is actually in animal behavior as a whole, rather than detection dogs specifically, though of course that's sort of where my career led me. Um, and I kind of got into canids in a, in a weird way. So I hit the end of my master's degree and I was like, what do I do now? And I got the opportunity to do my PhD in Austria, which highly recommend, a great country, super fun. Um, and there I was working with wolves and dogs at the Wolf Science Center, which is about uh, 23 or so miles outside of Vienna. Um, and there they actually raise dogs and wolves. So the dogs you see in the top left were raised there and the wolves you see at the bottom were raised by um, different handlers to compare their domestication purposes um, to see what behaviors might differ in dogs because of the domestication process that they've gone through. Um, so my question was looking at an equity aversion. So in humans, we call that fairness. Um, and looking at whether an equity aversion and cooperation have changed over the course of domestication. And at the end of my PhD, I still wasn't totally sure what I wanted to do. I still liked my work with dogs. I liked my work with wolves. I liked my work with primates, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Um, and I got the opportunity to do a postdoc at the Penn Vet Working Dog Center. And this is really where my detection dog experience started. So I certainly had no detection dog experience before I came there. Um, I still have no idea why they hired me, though I ended up being great for both of us, I think. Um, and the Penn Working Dog Center is a really special place. Um, if you ever get a chance to go there, please do. But they raise um, lots of different types of working dogs. So you can see a picture of a dog barking at a bark barrel. So they raise search and rescue dogs. Um, they raise police dogs, both single purpose as well as dual purpose detection dogs. And then the bottom right, you can kind of see a clip of where I started my detection dog career, which was in the lab. So I mostly worked in the research department, well, wholly in the research department, we'll say, working on a couple of different studies. So the first study I worked on was ovarian cancer detection. Um, we've done a number of them since then, and I've been able to work with lots of different breeds and personality types to get experience on handling these um, detection dogs in really important tasks. So I was asked today to talk about two studies that I worked on that might be increasingly relevant, especially to people in New York, um, my spotted lanternfly detection study, as well as my COVID-19 detection study, and sort of where that led us. And I'm sorry if you hear chomping in the background, my partner gave my dog some chew toys um, to try to be kind. 
So the first study I'll talk about is our spotted lanternfly study. If you have not heard of these guys, I think unfortunately you will very soon because they are slowly creeping their way into New York. Um, so a spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper insect. It is native to um, China and Vietnam. And we kind of first saw it in the United States and Pennsylvania in 2014. So it's been a while um, since it came here and it's certainly slowly spreading. Um, if you've never seen one, they're about maybe this big. They're pretty uh, hefty little insects. They have some weight to them. Um, and when I say they're a plant hopper, I say that because they literally hop. So they don't do a lot of flying. They kind of hop in the air and float down, fly down a bit. Um, and they feed on woody plants. And I say woody plants because they feed on everything. Um, they eat the phlegm, uh, the living tissue of the bark, and they also kill them by sort of making them um, get mold on them from their excrement. I'll talk about that in a second. But critically, these guys tend to sort of devastate um, like areas that grow grapes and things like that. So any area that there's a lot of wineries and, and vineyards type things, these guys can really decimate the area and they're doing a lot of damage and economic damage to a lot of different groups. Um, so of course the US and these different states and counties where these animals have started to uh, expand are putting a lot more effort into trying to keep them from expanding. So yeah, so in on top of eating the phlegm, they have this sugary excrement that is termed honeydew, and it kind of falls down the trees um, and makes the tree mold, and they die, sadly. And they have this kind of really interesting lifestyle life cycle, and this kind of comes into play and is really important when we're talking about how and why we can apply detection dogs to this question. So at the top, you'll see two different pictures. Um, on the left is actually a spotted lanternfly um, dropping eggs. So these are fresh, they're white, and then they kind of um, get harder and browner. And then on the right is what they look like most of the year. And so you can imagine to the naked eye, they can be harder to see. Um, but critically, these guys kind of lay eggs in one season a year. So from September until about November, they're laying eggs. Um, and they're on trees, but they'll find them on other substrates as well. So we saw them also on like pallets, so wood pallets. Um, you'll find them sometimes on undercarriages of cars, um, lots of different things. So in general, they do try and lay them on trees or on things near trees. So once they're laid, they have this brown like covering that is great for them because they're protected. Um, they're hard to see, hard for us because we're trying to get rid of them. And what happens is these eggs overwinter. So they stay there all through winter and then they hatch in May. And this little thing that you see here, this little egg sac, is maybe about this big and holds about 50 to 60 little nymphs. Um, so it's quite significant um, of a process and they lay a lot of them. And the thing that we were kind of tasked with and one of the reasons why that they thought detection dogs might be a good um you know part of a solution for this is because there's this period where the all the adults die so during winter the adults die and the eggs are kind of stuck there so any movement of this species during the winter is caused by humans so if you could train dogs to detect the eggs and have dogs checking you know logging companies and um cars and trucks that are moving in and out of the quarantine zone, you can at least keep them contained during this season where the actual adults aren't moving. So can you even make a spotted lanternfly detection dog? So this is kind of what was posed to us by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And there is some reason to think that you can use dogs for this. Um, so of course, I don't have to sell to you that dogs are using lots of different odors uh, to detect different odors. So lots of wildlife detection dogs. Um, they do use in the Southeast dogs to detect this citrus greening disease. Um, and they can detect this in the plants even before humans can see it visually or even before any molecular methods that humans have come up with. But the biggest problem that we had was kind of making a training tool for them. So what do we actually train them on? 
So one, the eggs are only found during certain times of the year. So you don't have access to eggs and thus you don't have access to your training tool 365 days a year. And of course, you all know you need to be training your dog, not just during the winter, but all year. We thought, well, maybe we can trade them on dead eggs and just have these dead egg samples and then transfer them to live eggs. And that was a question, you know, would, would this count? Would this be something that they can generalize to the live eggs? And then of course, if you wanted to use live eggs, this would be very difficult because you shouldn't move live eggs out of the quarantine zone. So if you were a handler that wanted to have a spotted lanternfly detection dog, um, how could you reasonably hold on to these eggs without making a bigger problem, without spreading, spreading the eggs yourself? So the first aim we had for the study before we even considered, you know, can we train a dog to be operational in the field was, can we come up with some sort of training aid that these dogs can use to safely train in the lab? So what we did was we trained the dogs on dead spotted lanternfly eggs. And this posed quite a challenge because as you saw, the eggs are on bark. So we had to train them that they're looking for just the egg odor, not the bark or the leaves. And you can imagine, Within that odor profile, the bark is a very strong odor. So we had to train them on just the eggs. And then we wanted to see if once they were trained on dead eggs, would they then transfer to live eggs um, or would they need more training? So then were they able to generalize this dead egg odor to live eggs? And then if we could do this, if we could do this whole process, which I would tell you was barely finished before COVID hit, thankfully, um, then we could say, yes, we can use these dead eggs as training aids for these dogs and then look into training them to work in um, an operational setting. And so this is like a quick little video of sort of what it looks like in the lab. So the dogs work out of sight of us. We watch them on a webcam, just like you're watching now. Um, we click them when they do their final alert. So all of our dogs are trained to do a passive alert. Um, either a sit or a stare freeze. Um, they get their click and they come out. And we try and do this single blind to double blind. So in our single blind scenarios, the handler doesn't know if it's positive or not or where it is, but the person at the computer will and they'll let them know if the dog's giving the correct response. Um, and sometimes we will do double blind where no one in the room knows whether it is uh, present or absent or where it is. So these were the three dogs. Toby on the far left is my dog. He still lives with me now. He's probably the one you'll hear click clacking around on the ground right now. Um, Pacey in the middle is a human remains detection dog that donated some of her time to research. And then Grizzly, the German Shepherd on the far right was one of the personal dogs of one of our uh, trading manager. And he just was really good at working the scent wheel. And so we uh, adopted him into our study as well. Um, and so sort of this is what we are working with. So this is a 16 ounce mason jar. Um, we worked with these dead eggs because when we first started this project, uh, we were outside of the quarantine zone. So we didn't want to bring live eggs in. We thought about it. How could we house these bugs safely without letting them get into the environment? Um, would the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture even let us? Um, unfortunately, before the project was over, spotted lanternflies had taken over Pennsylvania or over Philadelphia anyway, but at this time they hadn't. And so we had a whole process for making sure we only had dead eggs. Um, so all of our eggs were frozen in a nine, minus 80 freezer for 96 hours to make sure they were dead. And they were very dead at that point. Um, and they were kept in mason jars in a refrigerator when they weren't being used. And this was just to keep them from molding or you know modifying in any way. And the dogs were trained on both the scraped eggs, so we'd use just a little plastic like credit card type scraper to present, as well as egg masses on bark on the right. And you can imagine with a study like this, a lot of things are touching the eggs, and so we ended up with a lot of controls for the study to make sure that the dogs were really honing in on those spotted land and fly eggs. So just as an example, so in the top left, we had all of the researchers who donated, uh, donated egg to us also take a piece of bark from the exact same tree so that we could use that as a direct control for them. Um, in the bottom right are some of the other controls. So we had Tupperware, which is things that the uh, eggs had been transported in. 
um, cardboard and tape, same thing. Gloves, of course, because everything touched gloves. We also used paper towels because that's what we cleaned the wheel with. Um, and we really did our due diligence to make sure that there was really no other odors um, that the dogs were hitting on potentially. And I have a short video here. And I know videos can get a little wonky over Zoom. Um, so I'm happy to share the presentation later with anyone who's interested in watching it in real time. Um, but basically we started to train the dogs. So we, we took them out of the, uh, their kennels. We brought them into the room. We put the odors on the ground and we clicked when they sniffed it. And all these dogs had already known how to work a scent wheel. Um, but they didn't really get it. So we did Pacey and Grizzly first and they really struggled. And it really wasn't until Toby came in and hit on the eggs that we were like, okay, maybe this is possible. I'll admit our first two sessions with the first two dogs, I was not sure if we were gonna be able to train it, but I'll let you watch and see what we went through. So this is Grizzly. We just have three odors in there. SLF is that third one. He completely passed it. Showed no change of behavior on it. Send him again. She clicked on sniff for that one, but he really didn't give any change of behavior. Pacey does the same thing. She kind of passes the odor, not seeing anything interesting here. And they really struggled and we really tried to help them. So I think at one point in this video, Pat, who's Pacey's handler, um, goes in and tries to help her figure out the odor. Um, but for the most part, they were really just passing it. They really didn't, it really didn't seem like there was enough odor for them to, to stay interested in. At this point, she's just guessing. She doesn't really get it. So again, we were pretty discouraged. Uh, we were really not sure if it was gonna work and we were really you know, sad we weren't gonna be able to do this study. Um, but Toby came in and he passed the bark, which is in that first one, and he done the eggs and I gave him a quick click for that one. And he kept hitting on it. So Toby did really well. He was our first superstar that they all ended up doing really well. Um, and we went forward with the study. So once they had been trained on those dead eggs, of course, our end goal was if you train them on the dead eggs, can they then go and hit on the live eggs? Because really what we need them to do is go out into the wild and hit on live eggs. So this is what the live eggs look like to me as a normal human. They look the same, uh, but there was really no way for us to know if the odor profile was really any different. And I just put one graph in here so you can see it. So this is Toby's um, sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is how often he was hitting correct true positives and specificity is how often he was hitting correct true negatives and all on those first uh 27 or so sessions you know he has multiple days over 100 percent um and then you can see after the live here is how he does on the live egg masses so he has a small dip in performance um but eventually gets up to that uh 100 on all of them and so we were really happy with um you know, our results that it did seem like that the dead spotted lanternfly eggs did prep the dogs really well for moving on to those live eggs. Um, so they were able to distinguish the dead egg masses on bark. They could quickly swap from those dead eggs to the live eggs, which is great. And this is a nice picture of just how uh, prolific these uh, bugs get on trees. It's, it's really gross if you don't like bugs. Um, but of course our question really was, can they do this in a real world scenario? So the wheel is really great. I love the scent wheel for testing odor detection, um, but being able to distinguish odors on a wheel is not quite the same as being able to work odors in real life. And I'm sure you all as um, you know, detection dog handlers, even if in a sport world would agree, right? And so our next kind of step was to see if they could do it in other places. And so I have a video after this of the dogs doing it on the scent wall, um, on cars, and some other just random places we were putting it just to see that they could translate. And I don't know why sound isn't going, but they do have sound. <laughs> but you can see when I when we click because of course the dog comes back for their reward.
I'm walking really funny here because Toby had actually slammed into me and torn something in my knee. So I was wearing a brace, unfortunately, <laughs> during this handling. But they very quickly, of course, were able to translate, you know, what they were doing to just searching cars. And I tend to be a very hands-off handler and not do a lot of detail searching uh, with him, but he doesn't really need much handling. He's a, he's a press and go type of protection dog. But of course, it wasn't just Toby. Everyone became successful in the end. Um, Pacey struggled with not wanting to claw out the eggs. Uh, that's a side effect of her sort of search and rescue dog craziness. Uh, but everyone did really well. And we were really happy with this study. And again, this was just before COVID. So we kind of barely got it in um, before we all had to shut down and pen shut down like everywhere else. Um, so we completely stopped training until we started doing the COVID detection. So the dogs did really well. And this all ended in us training um, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's Canine Lucky. So she was raised at the center. We trained her on spotted lanternfly detection dogs. She is handled by somebody at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture um, and they do really well. I think they, they screen things going in and out of the quarantine zone. Uh, they deploy to nurseries and things like that. Um, and so she's doing really good in her job. And I was really happy to finally see some of our research actually get applied to kind of a real world setting. Switching gears a little bit, COVID, I won't spend very long on our uh, precursor to this because we've all lived it. Um, of course, it's rapidly spreading. At the time that we started this research, there wasn't a lot of very effective uh, screening for it. Um, so everyone was really looking for kind of that cost effective rapid test that has a high sensitivity and specificity. Um, so you can quarantine people quickly and effectively. Um, and so the question was, can we implement either testing or screening based on that odor profile? And you know, what role can dogs play in this? And um, this study that I'll, the first part that I'll talk about, we actually didn't run it in house because COVID closed us down. Um, so we actually had to collaborate with a trainer, um, Pat Nolan, if you've heard of him, um, in Maryland and work with his dogs to get the study done. So by the time we had published this, there was already some evidence that dogs could, to a certain extent, train to recognize SARS-CoV-2 from saliva and sweat. Um, but of course, these samples have potential high viral load, right? And so those are safety concerns, not only for us, but also for the dogs. And so what we were actually interested in was, could we train the dogs on samples where the virus had been inactivated? And this was partially for science's sake and partially because um, the rules were for us at the time, um, you know, the easiest and safest way for us to get our hands on samples was if they were processed in a way to um, deactivate the virus. So initially this was with detergent, eventually this was with heat, um, but basically we wanted to see if the dogs could still tell the difference between the positive and negative samples even after this detergent treatment. This was our set wheel at Pat Nolan's place, a little bit different than ours at the center, but our first question was um, using urine samples, if the dogs could detect positive and negative samples after they were uh, treated with detergent. And so you know, uh, it's an interesting question because you're adding a completely different odor profile to that urine um, and potentially a stronger one than the actual virus itself. And then could they then detect COVID after heat treatment? So in theory, heat treatment should change the odor profile a bit less than adding on a detergent. And then finally, when we were able to use saliva samples, could they do it on saliva samples? So could they move from those 
urine to saliva samples, but there's something maintained in the odor profile between those. Um, and as you're all interested in detection dogs, you might already know the answer to this, but the dogs did really, really well. Um, they had really high uh, specificity specifically. Um, sensitivity was a little bit lower, uh, but still very good. Uh, and at the time, really good, especially compared to the tests that we had. Um, so they trained, we trained nine dogs um, and they were able to do it detecting the COVID samples, the positive samples on urine compared to negative, and all were about, on average, over 90%. Um, and then they could transfer, having trained on those detergent samples to heat-treated samples, um, as well as transferring to saliva samples. So it did seem like um, there was some odor profile maintained from the urine to the saliva that was changed by COVID that the dogs were able to hit in on, which was really interesting. Uh, critically, though, our dogs were very unsuccessful with generalizing to completely new samples. So the problem that we had at this time was, of course, and critically, you know, hospitals in these places were focusing on saving patients and, and doing what they needed to do to keep hospitals going, that we didn't have a lot of samples coming into us. So we weren't able to present the dogs with the hundreds or thousands of samples that we'd have liked to, to keep their generalization up. And so we did a lot of repeated testing with the same samples and they stopped generalizing to new samples. And so this was really unfortunate for us, but I think really good for the field that we could put a paper out there showing that, you know, if you're not careful with this research, you can lose that generalization. So in theory, you want the dogs to hit on any person, no matter what, as long as they have COVID, but our dogs actually started to lose that generalization. So they were able to learn to discriminate SARS-CoV-2 positive from SARS-CoV-2 negative. So there was an odor difference, but they didn't necessarily generalize. And that's potentially due to the small sample size of odors we were able to present to them, the odor profiles. Um, Unfortunately, you know, a lot of the previously published studies before HARS had also used small sample sizes and also used repeated presentations, but didn't really talk about any of the issues that they had. And so we are really happy to, you know, put some research out there that people can use as a guideline for furthering that research. Uh, and this has been published. I'm happy to share the paper with anyone that's interested. Um, but having large numbers of samples is critical for learning generalization. So when you're working with medical detection in a scenario where you want the dogs to hit on that medical difference, no matter the person, um, you have to present them with a lot of samples um, and not use repeated samples. And we honestly find the same thing with our cancer detection dogs. If you keep repeating samples, they stop learning to generalize and they basically learn their samples as some sort of sample set rather than a general odor to, to generalize. We also had some issues with our controls. And again, this could be a byproduct of trying to do this research when it was really the height of COVID. So this was all done pretty much the summer right after COVID, so 2020. Um, we had a couple samples come in that, um, just as an example, and I, I can't remember exactly what we wrote in the paper about this, but one sample came in that they told us it was negative and the dogs were hitting on it over and over again. And we kept telling the dogs like, no, that's not right. Um, and of course, then the dogs got really confused because it probably was positive. Apparently the person had been sick about two weeks prior. Um, and if you remember at the beginning of COVID, which at least for me feels like a decade ago in a lot of ways, you know, you couldn't get a test really easily. There weren't just tests at, you know, Walgreens to pick up. So some people and this person whose sample we had very likely did have COVID, but hadn't gotten tested um, or had gotten tested with a with a less good test than what we had now. Um, another sample uh, was positive, or sorry, they told us was positive, um, but we weren't sure if it was positive. Again, issues with, you know, quality control, uh, but that was just a byproduct of kind of working at the height of a pandemic, honestly. Um, but again, it was really good to learn and be able to put a paper out there saying, hey, it's really important that, you know, when you're training dogs in this avenue, that the controls you're using are, 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 are appropriate. And of course, if you don't have good controls, um, you're going to have issues with learning that discrimination and generalization. So if the dogs were telling us it was COVID, but the sheet said it wasn't, 
and we were kept telling them it wasn't, um, they got frustrated and we did have a couple of times that we had to kind of backtrack a little bit with the dogs, unfortunately. I put current here. Um, it really shouldn't say current because this actually has ended. So we took five dogs once Penn opened again um, and ran a detection study in-house looking at whether they can, um, we knew they could, but to what extent they could detect COVID from sweat samples. So we had a whole process for getting sweat. And again, forget that current because it's done. Two of those dogs are at my house right now, not at Penn. Um, so we recruited participants from home um, and we required them to have a COVID test within 48 hours. And this was sort of our new way of doing quality control. So we made sure that they had a positive or a negative COVID test. So we could ensure that what we were presenting to the dogs was what we thought we were presenting. So we sent them a t-shirt, they slept in the t-shirt and they sent it back. Um, and then we would cut the t-shirt up and present part of that t-shirt to the dogs. Part of it went to some other researchers doing different types of research with the odor profiles of COVID. And then we would always follow up with these participants because we wanted them to sleep in the t-shirt as soon as possible. Um, and we would just hold on to the t-shirt until they gave us their COVID test, basically. And depending on whether it was COVID positive or COVID negative, we would then store the samples appropriately. So that means we would even get people that, you know, were sick with the flu or something that just was non-COVID. And then we could put it into our controls to make sure, you know, the dogs are really hitting on COVID, not anything to do with, you know, sweating more because you're sick or sweating differently because you're sick from something else. Um, and we were really aiming for a large number of samples with this one. So each sample was presented to each dog only once to help with that generalization piece. Um, and quickly here, uh, we went through an errorless learning method. So if you think of it as the COVID presentation, COVID positive as the orange, the negative as this blue slash black, we basically slowly increased um, the size of the amount of odor coming out of the uh, negative sample so that they could really focus on the larger amount of odor coming from the positive sample, not the lesser amount of odor coming from the uh, negative sample. And this is just a way of doing errorless learning um, because you basically allow them to have two levels of difference that they can hone in on, different odor, so positive versus negative, and different amounts of odor, more versus less. And then you slowly phase out that amount. Mm -hmm. So they more have to focus on the differences in the odor rather than uh, um, the amount of odor. And this went really well for us. The dogs were very successful with this method and it was the first time we had applied it. Um, but if anyone's interested in the specifics of this errorless learning method, I'm happy to uh, discuss it. Uh, I have a video of what it looked like. So I think there's a couple clips of Toby um being imprinted on this on the floor and then going into the wheel so again this was just click on sniff uh he likes to get a lot of extra sniffs in um so he uh he stays there even long after i've clicked which is great and this is the same toby from slf he is a multi-class dog so this is a hot wheel. So there is COVID in one of these. So the other ones have um, plain t-shirts or negative samples um, or gloves or relevant things. And you can see he's giving a very clear alert. Um, we also did blank wheels. So where there is no sample in the wheel because we didn't want to bias them towards presence or absence of the odor. So he has to go around to all eight ports. Um, and if it's negative, what you can't see in the corner here is there's a little climb like the KLIMB um, that he hops up on and sits to indicate no odor present. Um, and this was really great. The dogs did really well. So this is just a, an early on um, indication of basically how long they spent at each port with the orange being positive, the blue being the negative. And you can see that each of the three dogs we initially used on the wheel um, were spending more time, significantly more time at the positive than the negative. It's a little bit different. Toby, I require a really long alert from, and that's my preference as a handler, which is also why he has some really long falses because sometimes he's just very sure he's right. Um, the next part of this I was less involved in, but if you're interested in it, I'm happy to sort of divert you to the researcher who did it. 
We then tried to move these samples onto people. So what we did was we put those mason jars at people's feet and then at their knees and hold it further and further up. And you'll see where he's indicating at here. Um, I swapped his alert to a sit because it was easier to see. Um, and it was easier to keep his nose closer to the odor. But basically we do like a lineup situation. And this was to see if we could transfer the dogs to a more lifelike deployable type situation where they would be maybe screening people in a lineup. Again, maybe some places won't want the dogs to jump on them, but this was kind of our decision. And he has a sit and you can see he sits at the positive sample and the other two ladies have negative samples. Um, we then had to introduce some strangers um, to see if they would alert. So a lot of the initial research we did was with uh, people they knew, but of course in real life, it wouldn't be people they knew. So we put it on a stranger there to see if he would still alert. Uh, I try and stay the same for every odor, um, but and he does alert. So Toby did really well, um, and they, all the dogs pretty much did really well. Um, and I think that study's not out yet, but again, if you're interested in that specific part of the study, I'm happy to share you the contact information of the person who did it. Um, I think I'm about on time, probably talked a little bit faster than I meant to. It's a little bit strange still giving talks over Zoom. Um, but of course, thank you to all the tons of people that helped us um, with these studies. Um, everyone at the Penn Vet Working Dog Center. And then, like I said, I am at SUNY Cobble Skill now. We do have social media if you're interested um, or feel free to reach out on me. I'm on Twitter at Jenny Esler. Um, and I see a few people are still here. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Or if you end up reading this or sorry, watching this on YouTube, if you want to contact me afterwards, I'm I'm happy to talk as well. Ooh, well, um, <laughs> yes, very interested. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you anything you want. This is all, uh, you know, all, all public information, basically. Well, I, I think this is fascinating. This is Sally. Um, yeah. Also known as Charlotte, just to confuse everybody. <laughs> I'm president of the Great Barrington Kennel Club. And unfortunately, Nancy Allman, who is our um, seminar guru has come down with some with the plague I, we're not sure what it is apparently she tested negative for covid but she's yeah no really problem sick, really sick tonight yeah um but as i've uh, in addition to my work at with with dogs um i have served on my local conservation commission for 25 years yeah and so the spotted lanternfly is something that we are very concerned about, along with yeah. the woolly adelgid and the um, uh, emerald ash borer and the, there's one other, which I'm blanking on right now, which we're seeing frequently in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea that we could detect uh, these critters in in the in the woods around us would be really an amazing thing um, yeah hey if you're if, if you want to collaborate you know where i work yeah um, it was a really fun study and the dogs did really well um and they really enjoyed it um and i think it's a really good application for them and and you know a way for them to safely uh help us out with their noses yeah well, I, I, it's just, it amazes me what dogs can do. Um, one of my dear friends was diagnosed with breast cancer by her dog who yep. um, kept kind of sticking his nose in her chest and she couldn't figure out what, the, what was wrong with the dog, you know, because he was acting very strangely. <laughs> She's yeah. Like, Is your problem. Yeah. And um, she went in for her routine mammogram and sure enough, um, she tested positive um, for breast cancer. Yeah. So, and yeah. this this was self taught by the dog. I mean, he just he just got this. So mm -hmm. it's it's fascinating to me. Um, I'm also a member of the of a conservation group where they go out and they detect um, the dogs find endangered species and they find um, uh, you know 
other mm -hmm. things like yeah. that. So it, yep. it's just it's a, the the ramifications are are just incredible. I I it's amazing to me. Yeah, like I said, you know, our first two dogs really struggled with the spotted lanternfly eggs at first, and uh, we were really thinking, like, is this going to be the study that the dogs can't do? Like, they can do cancer, they can do everything else, but not these eggs. And uh, no, luckily Toby came in and told us we were wrong. They can still do it, and uh, all the dogs ended up being completely fine in the end. But um, yeah, at least at Penn, you know, all the studies I did, we also did chronic wasting disease detection dogs. They have a few dogs that work in the field now for that. Um, so far, there's been nothing we've thrown at them that they can't do. So, you know, the sky is the limit so far. So is there a part of this program that someone could um, join in on and and have like, like, I don't think I would do it, but I might. Um, could I get my dog trained? Uh, sort of. So a lot of the studies now are using a citizen science dog. So whether your dog is already trained to detect or is just really highly motivated, they have some programs, some time to train them. Um, so for example, the chronic wasting disease project, now they have three full-time working dogs on it, but it started as a citizen science project with just five or six, I think, dogs that lived around Philadelphia that came in a few times a week to test, you know, can we even train the dogs to do this? Um, so a lot of the studies, especially the pilot studies, just to see if it's even possible, now are being done with um, just local, you know, I don't want to say just pet dogs, but but just pet dogs. Um, and certainly that's what we'll start with at Cobalt Skill as well. So I'll be doing most of my research with, um, you know, just pet dogs, just pet dogs that are highly food motivated or highly nose motivated um, that can serve as sort of these pilot dogs for these studies. And there are some, I think, in Massachusetts. I don't know how close you are. I know there's one in Boston, um, but a lot of places that have labs do use pet dogs for detection work, especially if they're doing it for research. We're, um, well, at least Great Barrington Kennel Club, we're we're on the western, okay, <laughs> way western end of yeah. Massachusetts. We we border practically border New York. Okay, so. yeah, so a little further from Boston. Yeah, um, but a a lot of labs are now starting to do more citizen science situations because um, people are highly motivated to take their dogs to do things, so especially like with that chronic wasting disease study, I think most of the participants were just nose work uh, handlers that were looking for something else for their dog to do. Um, and it was highly successful, right? It allowed the researchers to use lots of dogs. Um, they didn't have to house them themselves. It got the enrichment for the dogs. And of course, for the handlers, knowing that, you know, they could use that time they spent with their dogs training you know, for like a greater good situation. It was really nice for that. I think everyone involved was really happy about it. And they I'm still not, do that. They still do that. I'm not sure if you can see the chats, but um, oh. Sarah. Oh yeah, you're in Boston. Sarah yeah, I will. Uh, I, so actually our, our, um, so she used to be the foster coordinator at the Penn Network Nug Center. She is now a researcher. And I have no idea. I know there's like a ton of schools in Boston, so I don't want to like put the name out there. And she's like, oh, that's my rival school. Uh, but she's there with her dog and she just actually got a search and rescue canine. Uh, but she would know. Uh, but there are a couple labs in Boston that do citizen science um, with dogs that are always recruiting. So I can give you the information for sure for a few of them. That's not a problem. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Do you know if UMass does anything like that? They have a very strong environmental um, if, program. If they're not, they should. Yeah. Um, it's really growing. It's one of those things that, you know, if you're not doing it, you're really behind the eight ball on this one. So I would have to look and see if they are because, um, you know, even at Cobalt School, I'm trying to collaborate with, you know, the fisheries and wildlife people and the other groups, Um to see how we can use dogs to facilitate their work as well. I, I don't know about UMass, but I can definitely look into it for you. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, oh, I want to thank you. Uh, this is fast, so fascinating to me. It, it uh, but because of both of you know both my worlds of so between sure. the dogs and the between the dogs and the conservation, it's um, it just uh it seems like there's so much potential uh, oh yeah for oh yeah 
and you know everybody every, not everybody but but the the number of people who have dogs is just it's huge and this is a tremendous resource and of course we all know that doing nose work with your dog has so many um has so many benefits if only just to make you and your dog a better team yep um so anyway yeah no it's 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 a it's a natural connection that i'm sort of surprised is not bigger than it is or did not grow earlier 10 years ago uh but dog research is is really picking up it has been again for about the last decade um and citizen science i want to say has picked up maybe over the last five years or so um so especially as papers come out from labs showing that they could do this with pet dogs you know i think more people will um, because just being honest, it's also cheaper for the lab, um, because people, you know, bring their dogs and you get to use them. And like I said, you don't have to pay for housing. You don't have to pay for all of that other stuff. Um, and, and it's, and it's really nice. It's a really great resource for them. And, and like you said, it's really nice for the dog handler teams to get that experience, um, of working in sort of a, a, a real world detection scenario. And, and, and most of the dogs do really, really well. Well, we would love it if you could keep us posted if there's anything. Um, oh, we got somebody coming who's just about to miss everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. If I got any studies coming up that we yeah. can collaborate on, I would be happy to. I loved seeing all the dogs um, at the nose work trials. It was really great. Made me want to do nose work with my dogs again because <laughs> now yeah. they're just retired sitting on the couch, basically. Um, but yeah, we're trying to get back into it. Yeah. Well, anytime, if there's anything we can do as a club, we would be, we would be thrilled to do it. If you, if you, I don't know whether you would ever consider holding a workshop. Um, yeah, sure. But we Absolutely. would be interested in doing that. Uh, um, and just, you know, let us know. Yeah, for sure. And, and thank you again. Um, does anybody else have questions? This is being recorded. Everybody should know it is being recorded. So if you, um, like I see jo Jody just joined us. Um, so if you wanted to um, see from the beginning or just review it, which is also interesting, um, it will be posted. The recording will be posted on the Great Barrington Kennel Club Facebook page probably in the next couple of days. Yeah, and I didn't. I should have put it on here. Uh, but if anyone wants to email me, my email is esslerjl at cobleskill.edu. Um, happy to take questions or interests in collaborating or anything else. Um, anything else relevant? I'll type it in the chat in case anyone wants to copy it. Well, thank you again, <laughs> and maybe I'll see you in the spring. Yeah, absolutely. The Doors fall. always open. Doors <laughs> always open. Okay, thank you everybody. Yeah, thanks so much. Great talk. Yeah, great no time. problem. Thank you. Bye.